Hi, everybody. Welcome to our human trafficking awareness virtual event. We are excited to have you here today. Um, I am excited to have all of our pre presenters here today and for you to learn through all of them. Um, my name is Susan Johnson, and I am the director and co-founder of the Alabaster Jar Project. We have been providing services to survivors of human trafficking and sexual exploitation with restorative services for over 10 years here in the San Diego area, specifically in the North County region. Um, that's why we're here today. We want to show you how you can get informed and get involved to fight the end-to-end -end human trafficking. Um, so there's several ways that you can do that. You can do that by obviously supporting your um, survivor services um, organizations like ours, Alabaster Jar Project. And you can do that through um, directly supporting with a donation. You can see the um, QR code on your screen um, for donations as well as for purchasing merchandise. Um, and supporting us does support survivors and empower them with housing resources as well as employment. 70% um, of our staff are survivors themselves. Um, you can also text HT awareness to 76278 to donate. And that's my little commercial, my little push. Um, all proceeds um, go directly towards serving, empowering um, survivors of trafficking. Um, this is a huge um, and a hard topic to discuss tonight, so I do want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, human trafficking is a tough subject, and you may hear things um, that uh, might be troubling or distressing, but we just want you to uh, we want to encourage you to stay present, stay grounded, um, try to take a break if you need to. Um, this will this is being recorded. So if you need to take a break, feel free that you can take a break and uh, maybe look at the video later and resume when it's uh, when you're when you're able to. Um, this should be an uplifting event. This should be an event also the where you hear um, how you can actually do something to make a difference. Um, and you will hear, hear from survivor leaders themselves and they will share with you about the hope um, and um, that they have and, and ex that they have experienced as well as how you can contribute to others um, experiences as well. You'll hear about survivor strengths and you'll glean from um, glean from um, the presenters um, you know how survivors have overcome and have um, survived trauma and um, how they recommend that you get involved. We will have a QA and a um, session after um, Chief Deputy um, District Attorney um, Carolyn Matsker speaks um, for about five minutes, and then we'll go into the Survivor Voices um, Survivor pre presentations. Um, and then after all three of the Survivor presenters present, we will have an extended, um, an extended Q and A session. Um, if you are not able to um, to stay for the whole thing, feel free that you can enter your Q and A questions into the Q and A tab, which should be on your screen at some point. Um, it might be at the top, it might be at the bottom, but there is a little screen um, on the a little icon on the bottom or the top of your screen that says Q and A. You can you can tap that. It will open up. You can enter in any questions and um, we will do our best to try to answer all the questions live. If we're not able to, we will compile the, the general consensus of the questions and email the answers out later after the with the recording um, video link as well. Um, that being said, we do have a full evening tonight and some great presentations. So um, without further ado, um, I am going to continue. We are very lucky to have several guests with us. And um, the first one is an amazing expert um, from San Diego Human Trafficking Task Force. Please welcome Sheep Carolyn Matsker. She's the San Diego Deputy District Attorney of the Sex Crime, and she's with the she's chief of the Sex Crimes and Human Trafficking Division. Um, also with us this evening is Keelan Washington, a lived experience expert, advocate, and public speaker. We also have Jessica Kim, who holds a master's in social work and is a member of the CSEC Action Team Advisory Board, and you'll learn more what CSEC stands for later. Um, and finally, we have our very own Amanda Moon Elvis, who is a certified HT counselor, author, and educator. Without further ado, I am pleased to announce the first speaker, Chief Carolyn Matsker. Thanks, Carolyn, for being here. Thank you very much. 
Let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, everything looks great. Great, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me here uh, for this great event. I really appreciate being here. Um, so this is just, I wanna give a disclaimer, this is just my perspective, a prosecutor's perspective. There's so many different people working in the field of um, human trafficking, prevention um, and healing. Um, and it's so this is just a prosecutor's perspective and what we all see is different. I see just a very tiny snapshot of what is going in going on based upon what law enforcement is seeing and what they tell me and based upon the cases that I see. So it's a very small snapshot of what's going on. But I want to talk tonight about what we are currently seeing in San Diego County with respect to human trafficking. So first I wanted to talk about legal definitions, uh, being a lawyer. So what is human trafficking? And tonight we're talking about sex trafficking. So starting at the very basics is you have prostitution. And what that is, is engaging in sex acts for an exchange of something of value. That could be food, that could be money, that could be shelter, um, that could be anything of value is prostitution. And then there's something called pimping and pimping is where if I'm a pimp, I know that somebody is working as a prostitute, engaging in sex acts for something of value. And I knowingly get support from that person's prostitution proceeds. We also have pandering and pandering is if I'm a panderer, I am getting someone to either to work for me and engage in acts of prostitution. That's what pandering is. And those are the building blocks of human trafficking. So then what is uh, sex trafficking in California? So a sex trafficker is somebody who deprives the liberty of another person by force, fear, fraud, or coercion with the intent to pimp or pander, which is why I talked about those first definitions. If the victim is 18 or older, then this has to be done with a deprivation of liberty by force, fear, fraud, or coercion for ha to have it be sex trafficking and not just pimping or pandering. If the victim is a minor, um, you just need to cause or attempt to cause a minor to engage in a commercial sex act with the intent to pimp, pander them, or make child pornography. So because children can't consent to sex, then it's automatically almost all the time automatically sex trafficking if a person is pimping or pandering a victim who is under 18. If the trafficker uses force, fear, violence, or fraud, then the sentence is the same as attempted murder, which is 15 years to life. Um, and I'm using the word victim here, and there's people who use victim, survivor, thriver, lived experience expert. I'm using the term victim because that's the term in the law. And since I'm a prosecutor, that's what I'm using. But um, there are many different ways um, that how people want to be called. So, um, and I, when I'm working with a victim or survivor, I ask, you know, I ask those questions. So, but for tonight's purposes, I'm talking about victims or using that term. So in um, San Diego, um, I want to talk about what we're seeing. So, Back when COVID uh, began, the schools shut down, the hotels and motels shut down. And with the school shutting down, we had kids who had a lot more time on their hands um, doing remote school, asynchronous learning. And so they had a lot more time on their hands. They were online all the time. So they were more available to traffickers through online recruiting. They were often unmonitored because you know their guardians were working and so there was just a lot of free time. So ever since the pandemic, we have seen younger victims and younger perpetrators. Um, we see you know 14 year old boys trafficking 15 year old girls, 15 year old boys trafficking 15 year old girls and we see girls trafficking girls. And you're gonna hear more about that from Keelan and the others. 
So um, traffickers can be male or female, um, all genders um, can be traffickers, all genders can be victims, um, all ages can be victims or traffickers. So there is no one way that a person is. Um, the other thing is with the hotels and motels shutting down, um, more um, trafficking started occurring, the sex acts started occurring in Airbnbs. And we continue to see that to this day, even though the hotels and motels are open, we're seeing a lot more of this being conducted in the Airbnbs. So back in, you know, way before the internet, um, the advertising for, um, for sex, for money, for prostitution acts, um, a lot of times that was conducted on the blade. You would have uh, women, men walking the blade. Um, and so that would be, you know, the cue, you know, to have someone approach them, have a customer or a buyer approach them, negotiate a deal, and then conduct the sex act, whether it's in you know, hotel motel, whether it's in a, um, in the car, um, the, the blade was where it was happening. Then with the advent of the internet, it went to online and most of the sex advertisements were on the back page, uh, website, the federal government, um, sued back page and back page was shut down. And what that did was it, caused the ads to be posted across all sorts of sites on the internet. So Backpage was down, but people still found ways to advertise, um, including Craigslist. Um, now we see the ads on all sorts of all sorts of sites and including uh, dating sites. Um, so then we've had a shift and you'll see in the next slide, because of the repeal of loitering with the intent to commit prostitution, a person can no longer be arrested or prosecuted for loitering with the intent to commit prostitution. What we've seen is a huge number of people uh, walking the blade, particularly there's a number of them, but uh, one, of, one of the big ones is at Maine and Alberta. And all hours of the day, uh, you see uh, people out there walking the blade. And so now we're seeing um, the, the advertising occurring both online and on the blade. So here's a picture of the blade. Um, and this was obviously in the evening and that's where it really gets busy, but you can see people there walking and cars stopping during the day as well. Um, SDPD and National City PD are trying to help with this problem. Um, they're doing some stings uh, on buyers. They're doing some stings on the people who are engaging in prostitution. And what they're doing there is if they um, detain somebody who's engaging in an act of prostitution, um, what's recently been happening with National City, or I'm sorry, yeah, National City PD is they'll bring them back to the station they'll write them a citation and then they'll release them. So that's what's been happening. But, you know, there's too many buyers and where there's the buyers, there's going to be, you know, the need for supply. I mean, that's, you know, it's really difficult to stop this. What we found is very few of the, um, people engaging in the acts of prostitution, the providers, um, are from San Diego County. That's what we've been finding. Um, there's been, um, you know, for gang crimes, if you can show that the crime is for the benefit of the gang, you can charge a gang enhancement. We're not seeing that. We know absolutely that the gangs are involved. There's no question, but the cases that are coming to us and the cases that we've been able to work um, are not showing that. Um, typically. What we see is the perpetrator is gang affiliated in some way. Um, I know I was seeing that when I was at the task force. It's been, uh, I think, two years since I left the task force. Um, and I was talking to Flavio Nominati, who's currently signed to the task force. And he said it's even more than, more than before in terms of gang affiliation. It's a higher uh, rate of people being gang affiliated. 
Um, I also asked him about other current trends. And, you know, there's always been the circuit where people are moved from place to place to place by their traffickers. But he said that he has really seen that a lot lately where the victims are not from San Diego, but they're brought by their trafficker to San Diego to work um, and then to LA. And he was saying there's a 40 block blade in LA to San Bernardino to Sacramento. We also know, of course, um, just um, from everybody's experience, but you know, in the cases that I worked on that they go to Las Vegas, they go to Reno and they would just move the, uh, you know, the victims around Part of that is it's easier to elude law enforcement. Um, if you advertise new in town, that can you know generate more money. Um, and I think it's also a way to, and survivors would know better than I would. And again, this is a prosecutor's perspective, but it's a way to isolate victims from friends and family if you keep them moving. Um, when I talked about the um, citations being made in National City, Whenever the Human Trafficking Task Force, and here they were working with National City, whenever they come in contact with somebody who's a provider, they offer services immediately, um, whether it's on the blade, whether it's a sting. You know, sometimes they see somebody who appears to be young, and then they set up a sting for a, a date at a hotel, and when they encounter uh, the victim, they immediately offer them services. Uh, we do not have people take us up on that for lots of very valid reasons. Um, you know, distrust of law enforcement. You know, they're concerned about their pimp or their trafficker. So valid reasons, but the task force is really making an effort to have good interactions, positive interactions with the victims. And hopefully at some point there will be a, a connection made and the person will get, will get help when they're ready for it or when they're able, able to do it. Um, on the arrests from the Maine and Dalberga blade, the citations, um, none of the people said they had a trafficker. Uh, none of the people who were cited said they had a trafficker, um, which is absolutely typical. Um, we have in the district attorney's office, the vulnerable persons diversion initiative. Um, and so out of those 20 plus citations that were issued in the national city operation, um, three of the victims have shown up to court. So they were charged with prostitution. Um, the, so three showed up to court, the rest uh, failed to appear. So bench warrants will go out for them. Um, and the three that did show up to court, they refused to um, take advantage of this program that we have. And what that does, the program is they go to, um, they go to North County Lifeline for services, um, there's some, uh, and also they can go to other providers for services. And once they're done um, with those services, they can go back to court, show they've completed and their case is dismissed. So the idea is really to bring services to people and then, and then dismiss their cases. We have no interest in, you know, racking up prostitution convictions or, you know, um, making it more difficult for somebody down the road to get a job. Um, by giving them prostitution convictions. Of course, there's always vacature down the road, but um, what we'd like to do is divert. The San Diego City's Attorney's Office has a new STEP program for the buyers. It's a much more intensive program. It's a more expensive program than they had before. And they are reporting that um, to the Human Trafficking and CSEC Advisory Council, they reported out that they're seeing positive results um, in this program. <clears throat> so I know this is a difficult slide to see, but I want to talk about prevention. Um, the traffickers are recruiting on internet connected devices, <coughs> all of them. They recruit uh, kids and adults through video games with chat features on dating sites, on social media. Um, there are ideas on how to protect um, yourself, how to protect the children in your life. Um, and you can take a, a photo of this slide if you'd like. It's also on the district attorney website. It's just really important to have those open lines of communication with kids about the dangers of the internet and have them talk to you about what they're seeing and prepare them for what happens when somebody does contact them asking for a nude 
asking for a date, asking, you know, telling them about working for them. Um, just, you know, ha have them be equipped ahead of time um, and hopefully will prevent um, a child from becoming a victim. Um, here's a list of some uh, applications and programs for guardians of children for prevention. Um, they're monitoring, it's monitoring software. Um, so you can also take a look at that. Uh, the DA's office doesn't endorse um, obviously any of these programs, but they are um, available um, for, uh, for guardians. So this is the uh, website where you can get more information on human trafficking. There's a lot of information on human trafficking um, on the internet. The DA's office also has a website, uh, prevention website for human trafficking. So I'd like to take any questions that people have. I'm sorry, I have to leave early. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you so much, um, Chief Masker. I, I apologize, I've been calling you Carolyn because I, I feel like I know you a little. Um, but at this oh, time, <laughs> you're so friendly and nice. Um, so for our attendees this evening, our participants, um, feel free, there is a question and answer tab down at the bottom of your screen. Um, currently, we don't have any questions in there. So I encourage you, we're gonna give you about um, five minutes now. If you have any questions, uh, please pop those into, okay, we have a question. It says, how prevalent is the issue in San Diego right now? Carolyn? I'd say extremely. Um... And like I said, it's we see the tip of the iceberg in law enforcement and the DA's office, the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, there's people who go to service providers who never report to law enforcement. Um, and so, but I think it is a huge problem. It is countywide. There is no place in the county where a person cannot become a victim. No place. Um, Keelan's gonna talk about a study um, that was done in 2014. But in that study, they asked about the residences for survivors and victims. And there were survivors victims who came from across our county. It crosses all socioeconomic lines, racial lines. Um, so it's extremely prevalent. Um, we do have a couple other questions. Um, Amy says, uh, what are the obstacles to accepting services? I think there's... There's so many, and I think there might be a speaker talking about uh, victims and survivors. So I'll just really quickly tell you, I think a lot of it is fear-based. I think a lot of it is potential feelings of shame or stigma. If you've had sex for money, you could feel that people are gonna look down on you so you don't wanna report it, or maybe you're gonna get in trouble and get arrested. Um, there's so many barriers and all are legitimate, you know, and I mean, when a survivor, you know, tells law enforcement, pound sand, <laughs> I, I get it. It's frustrating because you want to prosecute the case, but I totally get it. Yeah. Um, and um, earlier in your presentation, we do have two other questions, uh, but I had a question. And um, but it is you mentioned that uh, the the people that are brought they're brought down here. They're not sometimes from San Diego County. Are they U.S. citizens? So uh 80% of the victims of sex trafficking in San Diego County are U.S. citizens, um, or 82%. So it's not a border issue, like a lot of people think. Thank you. That's why, because I was like, wait, we need to we need to address that because a lot of people think it's because, oh, we're so close to the border and it's not. It's our it's our United States, our domestic um, youth that are being um, trafficked. So next question is, what is the STEP program? And you mentioned that was a, a, a program for... Um, for traffickers or for buyers? For buyers. And let me clarify real quick about the last answer. Um, so trafficking is different from smuggling. Just since you brought this up, movement is not required. So a kid can be born in San Diego, raised in San Diego, and then if they're pimped or pandered in San Diego, they are victims of sex trafficking or survivors of sex trafficking. No movements needed. I mentioned the circuit because we're seeing that, but no movements needed. So that's really important. Um, in terms of, of the STEP program, so it's a program where buyers go, so they get arrested or cited, one or the other, and then they go to court and they're told, if you do this program, you'll either get a lesser charge or you'll be diverted. And I think currently it's an actual diversion program. So they go for eight hours, pay 
I don't recall, but exactly maybe $600. And they listen to um, survivor voices. They listen to um, buyers um, who talk about how terrible it was, what they did. Um, they talk about, you know, they hear from law enforcement and then they really learn that, you know, hey, this person you're having sex with, it wasn't a real choice on their part, uh, usually. And I'm not saying that there's never a choice, but generally it's not a real choice on their part. Generally, there's somebody controlling them. And so they learn all about sex trafficking and the harm they're doing by buying human beings. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, guys, we Carolyn does need to get going. Um, and that was our, our five minute time frame for the Q&A. Uh, we do have um, four other questions, five other questions in uh, six other questions in the queue. Um, but we will we will email out those answers. Um, and maybe some of these um, actually are great questions um, that some of the, the survivor voices can answer at the end of, of the session. So thank you so much, Chief uh, Matsker. We so appreciate Appreciate your contributions um, to our community and for being here tonight and educating us. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. All righty. We are going to transition um, now. Our um, our next speaker is Keelan Washington. Um, Keelan is a lived experience expert, advocate, and public speaker in the field of human sex trafficking. Her dynamic work includes designing societal reintegration programming for survivors, including therapy, Court advocacy and career and educational readiness for Generate Hope's safe houses. She has internationally educated and encouraged law enforcement, industry leaders, churches, and higher education institutions, including Shared Hope International, the University of San Diego, and the Rock Church. We can also find Keelan sharing her story um, and expertise in the documentaries It's Happening Right Here and soon to be, re be released The Journey. And speaking, and she's also speaking to the award-winning The Washington Times podcast. Welcome so much, Keelan. We're happy to have you here this evening. Thank you so much. I will go ahead and let's see if I can get my presentation started as well. Give me one second. Perfect. Can you see my slides? Yes, everything looks great. Okay, perfect. So super, super excited to be here. I mean, like what a better time for us to have this conversation than, you know, Anti-Human Trafficking Awareness Month where we get the opportunity to really dive into what trafficking is. Um, I'm excited because I feel like there's dynamic speakers who will be sharing, but they're all from different perspectives in different fields, different experiences. And so I'm excited to be here just to share some of my expertise in the field of trafficking. Um, what I want to focus on today is the youth part of exploitation is what we call CSEC which is the commercial sexual exploitation of children. And I know Caroline kind of went over some of this, but I'll kind of just rehash a little bit of it. So any commercial sex act of a minor under the age of 18 is what we consider a C-sex survivor. Um, when it comes to our youth, anybody under the age of 18 cannot consent to sex. And so automatically they become a trafficking victim in that case. Um, what we also want to look at is I always look at trafficking kind of like this umbrella, right? Like there's different forms of trafficking. We hear human trafficking, we hear labor trafficking, um, but there's different forms of what trafficking actually looks like. And so what we'll see and what I typically share is from the trafficking side of youth, but that also happens in different ways. And so sometimes we'll see that there's familial trafficking, which means exactly what familial means. It's happening by a guardian, somebody who's in the home. What we see is a lot of parents or grandparents or step parents who are trafficking these kids um, and then receiving money or goods in exchange for that. We also see sometimes that there's child stripping. So sometimes when we think about the strip clubs, we're automatically assuming that 
everybody in the strip club sometimes should be over at least the age of 21 if they're selling alcohol, but 18 if they're not. But that's the idea is we get this, this thought that they're all over the age of 18. But what we're coming to find out is that a lot of the strip clubs are getting access to children who are child stripping in their establishments. And oftentimes being provided, these children are being provided by the traffickers and are in a relationship with the stripping industry than to benefit and profit. I think something that we often don't talk about is what survival sex actually is. And so sometimes we will see somebody or a victim who doesn't have a trafficker, and then we just automatically assume that it's prostitution or she just wants to. But I want to challenge the narrative a little bit because I have worked with uh, survivors who, especially in San Diego, we know the cost of living here is through the roof. Um, but what we see sometimes is we will have a single mother who has to feed her kid, is on government assistance, is getting EBT, Medi-Cal, but yet has no way to provide or feed for her children or keep the light, light bills on. And so in that aspect is she's engaging in sexual activity ju just to be able to feed her children. And so we see that as survival sex. We also look at it from environmental. Um, what is the poverty line that some of these communities and women are brought up in um, often foster this kind of sexual relationships as well. We are seeing it in the schools. I do a ton of work in the high school and middle schools and teaching about what does human trafficking actually look like. And for a lot of times, this is the first time that they're having conversation about trafficking in the first place. But what we do tend to see in our high schools and middle schools is the peer-to-peer -peer exchange of pornographic images. I think we're, we have fostered a culture that has normalized sending nudes. So what we're seeing is that there's a relationship between a 16 year old and another 16 year old. And this boy is asking for nude pictures of this girl and she's in this relationship and doesn't want to disappoint him. And so she's sending these nude pictures and pornographic images to her boyfriend. But what sometimes does happen in the schools is like now that young man is sharing those pictures with other children or he's selling them to other people to make a profit. And we are seeing that currently in the schools as well. We also see peer to peer uh, felicitation. So what we see with that is that a lot of the times what we understand about trafficking is like it's not only the trafficker, but also sometimes what we recognize is who are the recruiters. And sure, sometimes recruiters can be older, but a lot of times what traffickers are doing to get minors is they are trafficking. In this case, they're trafficking a young girl. And they're telling this young girl, I need you to go and recruit somebody else, somebody in your high school, one of your friends, and I won't abuse you tonight. I, I will let you eat. I won't, you know, give you these things. And so now this person who's being trafficked is forced into the life of recruitment just to be able to survive. And so we're seeing that still today in our schools as we're working with them. Um, so I know Caroline mentioned some of the stacks, but here in San Diego, the average age of entry into the life of exploitation is anywhere between 12 and 14. Again, that's the average age. We are seeing that sometimes that number is a lot younger, and it does depend on the type of trafficking as well. When we look at familial trafficking, we're seeing a lot younger. Um, but I also want to highlight that sometimes we're only thinking that it's kids that are being trafficked, that you know, if you are adult that doesn't mean that you're getting trafficked. It only happens to children, which is not true. Um, in my work in safe houses and working with survivors all across the country, something that we know is, is there have been women who are 60, 70 years old and are sometimes disabled or have mental health issues and they are also actively being trafficked. And so they also need services. But predominantly here in San Diego, what we're seeing is that average age is 12 to 14. Um, it's estimated that it's a $810 million industry, um, second profitable criminal industry, second to the drug trade. Um, and when we look at what facilitators can make, we're looking $670,000 per year, obviously untaxed. But when we're talking about facilitators, we're talking about traffickers. Um, with that, sometimes traffickers 
don't only have one victim. Sometimes what, what sometimes you'll hear the word is like, they have a stable, same thing that people and farmers do with horses is they have a stable of horses. And so what we will see is that there are traffickers who have a stable of women and who can hold three to four women at any given time as well. So I want to look at how does sex trafficking happen? Um, what we're seeing a lot of the time, it's what we call the grooming technique, which is a process by which someone with power manipulates a victim into sexual exploitation. It means that they're taking the time to understand who their victim is and what are their vulnerabilities to later exploit them. The grooming process can sometimes take a couple months and we've seen it up to five to six years. And so that grooming process is really a time where they are trying to develop trust with their victim. They are understanding their vulnerabilities. Where do they live? What was their upbringing? Asking what their trauma is because they want to be able to fulfill the need that they're struggling with to make their victim depend on them. So a lot of times we see this from relationship standpoints. I think sometimes we we get the idea of the stranger danger, but a lot of times with trafficking, it's somebody that they actually know. And so this perpetrator is coming in and building a relationship with these victims, acting like they're friends and they are interested in their romantically and they love them and they care for them to, to allow this victim to break down her walls to trust this individual. And now she thinks that she's in a relationship which was the same thing that happened with my exploitation. When I was trafficked at the age of 14, my trafficker didn't come and kidnap me. He took me through a three month grooming process and I felt loved and cared for, I felt seen. And so my trafficker was actually meeting all the needs that I needed. And I, and I always hold space that we're all vulnerable, right? Trafficking can happen to anybody. Us as humans, we have vulnerabilities and they can be exploited. What the trafficker tends to do is produce um, islands of isolation. So getting them away from their family, anybody who would raise a red flag that this is not okay, that something's coming up, that something's harmful is happening um, and as a means to control their victim. Sometimes they're forced into drugs and substances and alcohol to make them dependent, to make them do exactly what the perpetrator wants them to do without any pushback. Uh, pornography is definitely a one. There's always violence and threats associated with it. I have not met a survivor yet who was trafficked who said, like, I didn't suffer at the hands of my trafficker without any abuse through the whole time they were trafficked. And so it's always a part of their um, trafficking situations. I guess one of the questions that that does come up and Caroline also kind of talked about, and one of the questions was how prevalent is it here in San Diego? And so what we're seeing a lot of times, and I know she mentioned the internet, it's definitely happening on the internet. When we're also going into the high schools and middle schools, I think when I first started going into the high schools and middle schools, I was kind of alarmed on how often it was actually happening. I know, again, when I was 14, it was already happening and people weren't aware of it. But as I started to work in the high schools and middle schools and educate them on what human trafficking is, what we were seeing is that these youth are coming up and sharing that either they've been trafficked, somebody in their family is being trafficked, or they've had a trafficking situation happen to a friend or somebody that they knew. And it happens almost every time that I'm going into this high schools and middle schools. Um, we're seeing recruitment happen in, in different areas a lot of times when these survivors and victims are out of their environments with their family or people close with them. So like they're going to a party and they're hanging out with friends, movie theaters, concerts, um, we also see that it's happening in the churches, which I think is a big one for us to kind of just pay attention to. And I always say, like, when it comes to churches, the reason why it happens is because church is usually the place where we're the most vulnerable. It is the place where we feel like things aren't supposed to happen. And so what perpetrators actually do and traffickers do is they look out for those things and a way to, to meet a vulnerable population. The same thing with the college campuses. I also want to kind of dive into some of the misconceptions about trafficking and, and hope that I get an opportunity to kind of change the narrative of what we've understood about trafficking previous to this call. Um, a lot of times what we are faced with is the stranger danger concept, like I mentioned earlier. 
we are often taught and I was taught and our, we teach our kids and I'm sure everybody in, on this has heard the term stranger danger, but we are often teaching our communities that stranger danger is, you know, this person we don't know that's coming to kidnap us, throw us in the van. Or if you're in a parent, if you're a parent and you've been in the store and you lose your kid for like 30 seconds and that, that immediate reaction of, oh my gosh, some, somebody took my child. Um, what we're not preparing our communities for is the perpetrator who comes in to build relationships with us, to build relationships with our kids, which happens in a lot of different ways. Um, the other misconception is that it doesn't happen here. And um, what we're seeing is that there's anywhere up to about 3,000 survivors in San Diego at any given time. The, I know one of the questions that came up was like, is, is San Diego a hot spot? And it, it definitely is because we are a tourism industry. The other portion to that, if I speak a little bit into my own trafficking experience. So my trafficker, while I was trafficked here in San Diego, my trafficker sold me across 12 different states. In that time, what, what was for him is he always followed the money trail. And so if there were conferences, that's where we went. So here in San Diego, we have the a big conference center. We have Comic-Con. The, whenever the Super Bowl comes up, like that, that is when human trafficking tends to fluctuate and be at one of its peaks as well. And when victims are often met by their perpetrators. We often think sometimes that porn is not a problem. And I know the biggest consumer of porn porn or pornographic images is men. And I think the thought sometimes is that because we're watching it on a screen that we're not engaging in trafficking. And I kind of want to dispel that a little bit because what we tend to know, especially with Pornhub and their huge lawsuit right now, is that this idea that the person we're watching on the other side of the screen is choosing to be there. And what we've come to find out, especially with the lawsuit, is that's not true. These survivors and victims are forced to do acts in order to appease their traffickers. And so what's happening is that sometimes you're not watching somebody who's a willing participant. On top of that, sometimes these, these people who are on the other side of the screen are also not over the age of 18. And so that's the hard part is we think we're, we're not consenting or we're not contributing, but this is the one that sometimes we think about is like, well, if I didn't intentionally go and purchase somebody, then I'm not contributing. But there are other ways similar to this that does aid in trafficking. The other thought is that trafficking is the girl who is locked in change. A lot of times that we see these images of trafficking and we see a little girl behind bars or she's tied up in chains when that's not what trafficking actually looks like here in San Diego and here in the country. Um, what we see and sometimes we ask is like, well, if you are sold on the street, if you're sold online and it seems like you're free, well, then why didn't you just leave? And what sometimes I want us to understand is what psychological bondage actually is. It's a victim who has, especially if we're talking about the average age, you're taking a victim who has been completely isolated from the people they care about. She's out of the way of safety. A lot of the times documentation is taken from her. So she has no access to ID, passport. The money that's being profited off of her body is not given to her. And then there's the level of um, abuse that's happening, right? So she is being abused and tortured and then told that if she leaves, that he'll kill her, or kill somebody that she knows. So then the, and then I think what we often see and sometimes is that depending on the states, right, we're still putting survivors in jail saying that it's their fault. So I think sometimes the question then becomes not why didn't you leave, but how could you? Um, and so psychological bondage is very important for us to recognize. Um, the idea that they are rescued when they are actually given an opportunity to get out. Survivors are resilient. If you give them, a lot of survivors, the opportunity to be able to get out, they are able to, when they're ready and they feel safe enough, they will get out of their situations. And then I'll just um, end with this one, um, the idea of prostitution versus trafficking. For centuries and centuries, we have labeled trafficking as prostitution, which implicates that this is a choice, that the person who is on the other side, the woman who is standing on the corner, is choosing to be there. 
And what we've come to know now is that it's not a choice. It's not something that these girls, no, no survivor has that I've ever worked with has ever said that this was the choice. This is what I wanted when I turned 18. This is what I wanted as a kid was to be bought and sold, um, to be purchased for a rape. That was never a conversation that I've had. And I'm sure I probably never will. Um, and so the last part of this is just how can we help? How can we be a part of the solutions of this? And so I always look at prevention as being the first step. So both community and school-based education and awareness. Again, if we're looking back at the ever, average age of being 12 to 14, it's already happening in our high schools and middle schools. So how do we begin to put education in the high schools, which I know me and Jessica are a part of a program that does do that currently. The other part of prevention is inviting survivors leaders to come to educate your communities. We all have different community communities, everybody on this call, whether it's work or community groups or youth, like allow us to come in and educate to keep our community safe. Um, so I'll end with that, but I do just appreciate the time to be able to share. Also, if we don't get to some questions, are there additional questions outside of this presentation? Definitely happy to answer them and then to be able to send out any additional resources as well. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you so much, Keelan. You are such a treasure. We so appreciate all of your contributions to our community. And we just, I, I personally love working alongside you. Thank you Thank so much you. for sharing. Thank you. Next, we have um, Jessica Kim as our next speaker. Um, Jessica endeavors to find solutions to eradicate human trafficking from our communities through collaborative efforts and partnerships. Jessica's life experience of familiar trafficking at, as an immigrant from Mexico has given her a deep understanding of what is needed to heal from trauma and has positively impacted the lives of the people she serves. Jessica uses her knowledge and life experiences to assist survivors wanting to exit the life of exploitation through mentorship and connection. She holds her master's degree in social work from San Diego State University. She is working towards her license in clinical social work and specializes in CSEC youth mental well being. She is the co creator of Zion Story, a human trafficking awareness and prevention program for middle and high school youth. She also has de developed the Flourish Academy, a 12 week health and holistic wellness curriculum for adult survivors of human trafficking, which we did incorporate into our uh, services here at the Resource Center for Alabaster Jar Project. Um, she was featured in the Stolen docu-series, a, a year-long investigation into child sex trafficking and exploitation documentary, which was produced by NBC News um, in San Diego, Channel 7. Um, it has won several prestigious awards. She has also served as the survivor voice of the CSEC Advisory Council Subcommittee. And um, that is a mouthful, but we're so excited to welcome Jessica Kim. Hello, everyone. Can you see me? Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm so excited to be here today. We've had such a wonderful presentation so far. I wanted to uh, really just add to everything that has been talked about and really just go a little bit further in navigating the depths of human trafficking. I want to really just focus uh, this presentation and the time we have together on recognizing the impacts of trafficking with adult survivors, adult victims, but specifically with the immigrant population. Um, as Susan mentioned, I am a survivor of trafficking. I was born in Mexico. And so coming here uh, to United States at age seven and being trafficked throughout my childhood and teenage youth, uh, this is something that is really close to my heart. This is, uh, you know, just as we're talking about research and the numbers that you have seen, um, I just want to recognize that this is really coming from a place, a personal of a personal experience, but also having worked with the immigrant population. So let's go ahead and get started. Next slide. So I want to first start with this image here. This is the, it's called the triple trauma paradigm. And so basically what this shows um, 
It's really the understanding that individuals who go through the migration process can freely experience trauma in multiple stages, right? Uh, we have not just because we live in San Diego, but because we are the United States, there's migration, uh, there's uh, immigrants coming to United States from all over the world. And so this is a really important just image for us to recognize the vulnerabilities, especially when we're talking about human trafficking and what each person really experiences even before coming or arriving to United States. So if you see, for example, the top, uh, I think it's green or yellow where it says county of count, country of origin trauma. So this really refers to this initial trauma experience by people, right? This is the home country. This is a place where they might be escaping war or conflict or oppression. Um, this might be, you know, just um, you know, armed conflict or pos or pros sorry, persecution, political instability, economic hardships. I think for us, uh, my family specifically, when we decided to immigrate to United States, it was out of necessity. It wasn't something that we really wanted to do. Uh, my mother, especially, she wanted something better for me and for her. So just being able to come to a new country, not speaking the language, uh, not knowing the culture was traumatic in itself. So then in the middle section, you have this migration process of the migration of coming from their country uh, to United States. So this process of migration itself is traumatic, right? It involves uh, leaving one's familiar environment of often in challenging circumstances and really undertaking this journey of not knowing who you're going to interact with or the safety of this journey. So this, this migration process for people, for immigrants, um, really sometimes involves human trafficking on route. It definitely includes exploitation. It, inf it includes family separation. It includes the loss of belongings, right? Are you putting yourself really into this dangerous situation in unknown countries uh, and really being vulnerable to any exploiter or trafficker? And then you have the resettlement process, which, you know, if you watch the news, uh, you recognize that we are, there's lots of migration coming. Um, I was working with IRC, International Rescue Committee, and all of our work had to do with immigrants, asylees, and refugees population. So coming to the resettlement process to a new country, like I mentioned, this faces additional challenges in the resettlement process. So this could include the culture shock. We, this could include discrimination, language barriers, really difficult accessing services. And for this specific population, um, you know, coming to San Diego, having uh, to spend high, you know, just the high cost of living, for example, just brings on this whole different psychological aftermath of trauma that has already been experienced throughout uh, this process. So really understanding and addressing this triple trauma paradigm in context of migration and exploitation and trafficking is really important as we begin to, to deep, dig deeper, dig deeper into what trafficking is. Uh, there was a mention that 80% of trafficking victims are nationals. And also this may be true from older um, data, we don't really recognize what the impact is currently. There's no updated data that really uh, shows the data of how many people are nationals, how many people are foreigners. But what we do know is that we have lots of kiddos that are that are migrating alone, 
So unaccompanied minors uh, thoroughfriving into the United States alone. And I saw this personally uh, through my work with the with the immigration with the um, asylees and immigrants coming into the United States. Can you go into the next slide? Oops, the other way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so really when we're talking about working with adults specifically, there needs to be this um this identification of there being force, fraud, or coercion. As Keelan mentioned before, if you're talking about anyone under the age of 18, there does not need to be any kind of force, fraud, or coercion. If a youth is engaging in any kind of sexual act with profit, that is considered trafficking. If you're talking an adult over the age of 18, force, fraud, and coercion does need to, either one of those that does need to be identified. So for example, this force, right, physical assault. So this is just what it says. It means what it says, right? Physical assault. Victims uh, may face physical violence as a means of control, really making it difficult for them to escape due to fear of harm or retaliation. There's sexual assault that happens constantly. Uh, one of my pet peeves, and this is just me personally, is calling, um, you know, calling trafficking work because work also has this notion of it being uh, something that we're choosing, right? So sexual assault, we do know that trafficking, even prostitution, there's high level of assault, of harm. Um, so for it to be called work is, is really not adequate. Um, isolation. There's this piece of isolation that Keeling talked about uh, where traffickers isolate victims. We know that is a very common, um, you know, tactic to the grooming process. This confinement, this could also be just physical confinement, but more so it's this psychological confinement. And so this notion of fraud this is really through deceptive schemes or false promises. For the population of uh, immigrants, this is often something that we're seeing where this person is promised, you know, just uh, the American dream of coming to the United States, of working, of providing for your family. And then once they get here, deceptive employment where they're not living in adequate situations. They're often uh, put into just rooms with lots and lots of people. The hygiene is less than, you know, than we would hope for anyone. Um, so this is really, you know, this is uh, often a tactic, tactic that is used. Traffickers may deceive individuals with false premises promises. This is, there's this notion of uh, sham marriages. Victims can really be lured into fraudulent marriages under false pretenses. Re really, this further complicates the escape or, um, you know, due to legal social implications. Sometimes the documents like Keelan said are being taken away or they're being held. So it makes it really hard for, you know, people in these situations to, to be able to get away. Withholding wages is something that we also see. This is economic control um, through wage withholding, right? So this can also trap victims in difficult situations uh, where they're not financial dependent, where they're not financially independent, and so they're dependent on the trafficker. And this confiscating of documentation, this is very common with our national um, trafficking survivors or victims, but this is also very, very common with our immigrant population. This notion of barrier to escape. So this is the coercion. Um, so how does this happen? It happens with threats against family. It's threats against the victim. It's just this threat of harm. I can uh, 
you know, think about my own experiences where I knew that if I even tried to escape the situation, my family would be harmed. And this was known, this was told, this was like repeated over and over again. So if you can imagine just being in these situations and being threatened and saying, you know, where we know, you know, where your parents live, we know where your relatives live. If you don't do what I'm saying, then harm is going to come to them. So this is very effective for traffickers and it happens very often. This sense of duty, this is something that Keeling talked about, this trauma bond, right? Um, this Some people may feel a sense of duty, especially if, for example, a trafficker has brought uh, somebody from another country. Uh, you know, there's this sense of having to stay with this person because they're trying to give them this sense of hope, right? Um, this debt bondage. This is really where victims may be trapped in situations where they owe significant debts. Uh, this is something that we often see as well. And the withholding of legal dogs and IDs. So can you go to the next slide? The next slide really shows the Polaris heat map. I really like to show this because it shows a representation of where um, you know, the calls are coming in from. So if you don't know about Polaris, please you know, check out the website. It really has a lot of great information and updated data where it talks about where the hotspots. And so just, I have a couple minutes left, but just to point out, California has emerged as a magnet for sex trafficking, right? And for sex trafficking of children, we know that for sure. So the FBI has identified three cities within California. So they're San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego is the third one. Next slide, please. I don't think I have enough time. <laughs> um, Trauma-informed care. I really wanted to spend some time on this because I know we have people that are really interested in working you know, with survivors or helping survivors or assisting survivors or just supporting organizations like Alabaster Jar that really does a great job of supporting survivors through their healing process. But this six guiding principles of trauma-informed uh, approach, it really recognizing, it recognizes and responds to the impact of trauma on individuals, but it shows it in these six different buckets that we have to really um, think about the safety and make this a priority, right? We need to build trust with, uh, with the people we're working with. And this also goes through transparency. We have to be able to provide the peer support. Peer support, survivor advocacy, I mean, we can talk about this all day, of how important it is. There's something about survivors and survivors connecting that really impacts positively to, to the person trying to get out of the situation. They can see us as, you know, just someone to, you know, they can see that healing is possible. They can see that there is a future after exploitation. And so really to think about this piece is an important piece. Collaboration, mutuality, this really involves individuals um, individuals working together, collaborating. We cannot do this work alone. And so what are those things that you can bring to the table to help support um, survivors as they're exiting exploitation? Do you have access to, to uh, employment? Do you have education, you know, access to education, to attorneys, to lawyers, you know, to, to jobs, right? How can you freely collaborate with organizations to empower each other to help um, people out of exploitation? So this piece of empowerment, voice, and choice, this really makes it a priority of empowering survivors 
or victims coming out of exploitation. It respects them for their strengths and their abilities instead of seeing them as someone who is weak and cannot do for themselves, right? We are such an empowerment, empower, empowering group of people. And so when we're using this approach, we're really looking at what are the strengths of this person that is sitting in front of me and how can we point those things out so they can empower themselves out of exploitation. And we can't forget about this cultural piece, right? Especially no matter who you're working with, whether it's immigrants um, or, you know, native, just people from the United States, you have to look at this cultural piece because, um, because it's an important piece. Be sensitive to culture, be sensitive to historical and gender of uh, related aspects, right, of someone's identity. We all come from different kind of backgrounds and genders. So really recognizing and respecting diversity and acknowledging that, you know, trauma can influence us by culture and historical factors. Um, and I think this is the... Last slide, one more slide, just really quick. Um, this is the last one. So the four R's of trauma-informed care, which is to realize, recognize, respond, and resist. And I'm not sure if there's the next slide, but. Yeah, trauma-informing action. So this recording is being, uh, it's being recorded, so please just time, take time to read through this um, and really watch it back so you can really understand how you can take um, action um, in helping all of us eradicate trafficking from our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, and we appreciate your input and sharing your expertise with us tonight. Um, we are so excited to that you were able to join us. Um, we are running, we want to be mindful of everybody's time here, so we are going to um, move forward with our next speaker, um, who most of you know, our final speaker is Amanda Moon Elvis. Um, she serves on the grant writing team at Alabaster Jar Project and coordinates marketing and public relations, as well as assists with fundraising. She is a California board certified human trafficking counselor and lived experience expert, a local author, her book, Rebuild and Thrive, helps survivors of trafficking and exploitation like herself on their road to recovery. She is also actively um, engaged with the Alabaster Jar Project as she is part of our staff here. And uh, we incorporate her book into our programming for resource. Please welcome Amanda Moon Alabas. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Okay, thanks for sticking around everybody. I'm gonna do a quick presentation and then we'll get to the Q&A. Okay, I'm gonna do a presentation on just, you know, similar to what Jessica just talked about, like, there are so many strengths that someone gleans from um, surviving abuse. And it's, it's, you know, we, we're often, I'm a survivor myself, and I've often heard people talk about survivors as a difficult population to serve. Um, but there's also a lot of strength there, you know, so a little bit about me. My name's Amanda. And I, as Susan said, I serve as a public relations manager for Alabaster Jar Project. I have been working for, with AJP for five years, and I've been a W-2 part-time employee for four of those years, and I wear a lot of hats. I manage grant campaigns, I run our social media, I manage a blog, and I also wrote and published a curriculum called Rebuild and Thrive. I'm also the first graduate of Grace House, so everything that the survivors at Grace House are having to go through, I was the first one who completed the program from start to finish. Do you recognize any of these famous faces? Um, what do you think they all have in common? 
Uh, there's Jane Fonda, there's Lady Gaga, Kesha, Brendan Fraser. What are they all known for? The last thing you might think is that they're all sexual exploitation survivors, but they are. Uh, I will let you do your own research here. There's tons of information on the internet about this, but Jane Fonda, Lady Gaga, Kesha, and even Brendan Fraser, and way more than that, have come forward to publicly talk about the sexual exploitation they survived in the entertainment industry. And then there are also uh, Olympic athletes and other high profile uh, figures. I believe there was an NFL figure who came forward as sex trafficking survivors, but because of the stigma of the term trafficking, we're probably less likely to hear about this, but that doesn't mean that it's, it's not happening even at a higher level. And I should note that all of them have had really great comebacks or longevity in their career. Uh, they express a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. Brendan Fraser isn't known for being a trauma survivor. He's a movie star. Uh, Lady Gaga is a multimillionaire pop star. And Jane Fonda is, she's Jane Fonda. They aren't defined by their trauma because they have done so much more with their lives. Just like many of the survivors here at Alabaster Jar Project. So after surviving trafficking, there are a lot of setbacks that survivors face. There are legal battles, homelessness, unemployment, not to mention mental health issues such as anxiety or PTSD. The survivor population faces so many setbacks that, as I said before, were often talked about as a difficult population to serve. Um, and as you heard in previous presentations, survivors are some of the most vulnerable individuals in our community. But there are also, survivors also have a lot of strengths that make them good friends, parents, students, and professionals. No one goes through the trauma of surviving abuse and then rebuilding their lives with nothing to show for it. Being a survivor changes you, and it changes you for the good. For good. So obviously, the first standout strength that survivors possess, possess is resiliency. Survivors have been through all sorts of devastation that trafficking and exploitation causes, and yet they go on to live normal, healthy lives, and that's amazing. In the professional world, this means that they'll be able to work through tough problems and they will come out on top. Survivors don't give up easily. They have a lot of grit and a lot of energy to get through tough things. And anyone have anxiety here? When you're constantly worried about being killed or robbed, uh, like survivors of trafficking often are, you have to play out all scenarios in our head to survive even morbid scenarios. And although anxiety causes us a lot of grief, it can help your problem solving skills. We have to train survivors how to do this with mental control, not freaking out or engaging emotions, but there is a way to, to use that quick thinking and that analytical mind. Um, we have plenty of survivors who went through the Graves House program who ended up having high marks in math, specifically math. Um, I really think this is because of their uh, natural eye for logic. We had to rely on logic and quick thinking in our trauma, and it's just a matter of applying that skill properly in our professional life or in social settings. And reading people. Some survivors become experts in reading people. When you're trafficked, you have to be able to read every person you interact with and fast or else you might not survive. If you're familiar with narcissistic abuse, most survivors of trafficking have dealt with narcissists, so they quickly see questionable patterns in other people. In the past, we've had survivor staff members check up on references of new hires, not only because they knew what to look for, uh, but also because they gleaned a lot of information uh, with little effort. Literally, they would just Google the person and they found out like tons of information. And of course, survivors can also be experts in lived experience. Um, nothing can give you a first person's view of trafficking like actually surviving trafficking can. And oftentimes when a survivor goes into recovery, they have survived several different instances of trafficking abuse. So they have a range of experiences to, to um, draw from. They really can be experts in human trafficking. Uh, but not only are they experts, but they have a certain level of knowledge in how to deal with new survivors who are still being mentally manipulated by residual trafficking anxiety, um, abuse anxiety. Sometimes a policeman or a therapist will not be able to reach a survivor or put them, it will put them on their defense, just like Carolyn said. 
Um, but when a survivor leader interacts with a new survivor, there tends to be better results. For me personally, when I was in recovery, I trusted survivors before I ever trusted mental health professionals or law enforcement. So lived experience is a really powerful thing when serving the trafficking survivor population. I do police consultations to this day because I'm different. I'm not wearing a uniform and I'm not coming from a perspective of law enforcement. I'm coming from the perspective of that was me seven years ago. What would I need in that moment? And that's something really only survivors can do. And empathy. Almost every survivor we serve at Alabaster Jar Project wants to go into a career where they can help others. So empathy is a huge strength. Um, survivors have gone on to pursue careers in drug counseling, um, nursing, teaching, therapy, social work. Uh, I'm a grant writer, so grant writing was my way of giving back. The, there, there's a lot of empathy there. There's um, a lot of willingness to give back. I know there's this saying about like, um, people uh, go into the depths of hell and instead of running out screaming, they're, they're going back into hell carrying buckets of water. And I see that every day. Almost everyone who comes into the program wants to help. They want to be a therapist. They want to work at AJP. And that's really special. And all survivors are worth fighting for. So often we focus on all the setbacks that survivors face that we forget all, the sur all that surviving trauma teaches them. They are funny, smart, empathetic, intuitive individuals who just need a chance. Give them a chance and watch them amaze you. And other, as others before me have shared, there are plenty of ways that you can help survivors. Uh, meaningful volunteering is key. We've had dentists, counselors, grant writers, fundraisers, teachers, college counselors, and tutors share their skills to truly impact the lives of survivors. Just look into your life and think like, how, how can I help? How, what, what blessings I have that I can give to, to survivors? And we've had some really amazing volunteers come through. We also have several serve days in which groups of volunteers come and serve the resource center or our residential program, Grace House, with yard work, cleaning, and decorating for Christmas. We have organizations and individuals fulfill Christmas wish lists every year, and that seems to be a lot of fun for them. Obviously, housing is a number one need, along with supportive services. We provide these things through AJP, so to support us, be it financially or through volunteering, helps provide housing and support directly to survivors. That's it. Thank you so much. I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A left. Yes, thank you, Amanda. Um, we have, I would, I want to invite all the panelists to um, turn your cameras on at this point. And for our participants, now is your time. We've got six questions in the queue. Uh, please, um, there's now seven. Um, Elizabeth um, asked a question, do they go to schools and recruit? Who wants to answer that one? Um, Jessica or Keelan, I, I, I can't decide which one of you is best uh, for that. Um, I, <laughs> I see Keelan unmuting herself. Yeah, okay. I'm like, we both work in the schools and absolutely. And I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier about you know, the trafficking and then the recruitment process. But a lot of times we're look, perpetrators are looking for a vulnerable population and our youth tend to be the most vulnerable population. So absolutely, in short. Okay. Um, another question. How does San Diego compare to other cities? Is it worse here? And if so, why? I can answer that. I think that as you saw in the heat map, it's everywhere, right? So you see the entry points, for example, Florida was mostly in red. You see New York and the Northeast, you see California. So I wouldn't say that it's worse here. Although we do have a city that is tourist town, we have lots of convention centers, right? We have a lot of tourism. So these are the things that really impact trafficking. Uh, but then you, if you go to Vegas, it's like, right, it's the same thing. It's like tourism and casinos and all things. So I wouldn't say it's more. I, I would just say it looks different. Trafficking looks different in each region of the United States. 
And yeah. just because it's not on the heat map either doesn't mean that it's not happening. It's very underreported. And uh, like I have visited uh, Alaska, I, I did a, a cruise through Alaska and visited several sites. And I I saw with my own eyes and I, I even had a survivor that self-identified to me um, that and it was happening there. But if you look on the heat map, it's not. Uh, because it's underreported and nobody's, um, nobody's, you know, capturing that data. So yeah. Keelan, I'm sorry, I cut you off. You were going to. No, 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 it's okay. I, I love the insight. Cause I think that's the thing that I kind of think about is like my own personal story of exploitation. Like I was sold all across the country. And so in predominant states, in some states that you probably wouldn't think like Massachusetts or somewhere else that you're not thinking are high rates of trafficking, but they are. I think one thing that we also have to realize that is that we are a state that does, for the most part, we still have a lot of work to do, um, but understands what trafficking is. There are still states out there do not that are still calling victims prostitutes and are still penalizing them and putting them in jail and telling them it's their choice. So not all state has recognized the way we have in California. And that's another reason why it's also underreported. If I can just add to that, Susan, before you hop to the next, and also children are being arrested. So when we talk about CSEC youth and how we recognize the impact, they're victims, they're not, right? Um, other states are not are not practicing that, so. Yeah. San Diego is definitely a forerunner with their task force and their services provision. Um, and and they, they also are being used as a model. Um, so we're very proud of San Diego. Um, so we're asked, do a lot of buyers take advantage of the STEP program? Yes. So I oversee the Survivor Voices program of that and the presentation of that. And absolutely. Um, every time that we we do it quarterly and every time it's completely packed. Um, I will say like it, it is is a interesting environment to be in with buyers who are engaging in this. But I will say we are a state that is trying to change the narrative and understanding, even with buyers, some buyers aren't understanding the actual harm that's being done. Um, some buyers aren't purchasing children. And so when we're having these conversations of the impact of actually purchasing a person, um, we're seeing a lot of beneficial results in the way that their brain is shifting that narrative of actually putting a person behind the purchase. So yeah, almost every group is packed. Um, there was another question um, regarding um, school grounds. Is there any risks on school grounds or other places that parents should watch out for? I mean, I think I hit the list of... <laughs> Of all the areas, but I will say like, also, again. <laughs> I mean, like I'll, it, it'll be on here, but I also think that, um, we are a community and a society who is on online platforms all the time. And our kids are on social media. What we're seeing is, is a huge impact in the gaming industries. And we're seeing roadblocks and Fortnite and Call of Duty. And because there's an online chat feature, what's happening is these kids are thinking they're talking to other kids, not knowing that they're actually talking to other traffickers. And so what we tend to look at is like, how do we keep our kids safe online? But yeah, I mean, anywhere that a perpetrator has access to a child, they're going to be there. They're preying on that. And so, yeah, we're seeing it in the schools and outside of it as well. And there's recruitment happening peer to peer as well. Absolutely. Um, and then one other question was, do you, do you want to call out a few of the apps um, specifically that are being used to recruit individuals? Yeah. So we have um, all of the social media. So Facebook, Instagram, um, we're looking at discord as well as another gaming platform that people are using to chat WhatsApp. Um, there's just so many. I, I always look at it when we think of online, if it has a chat feature, there's an op there's an option for perpetrators to have access to children if they're using those. So absolutely. All right. Another great question. Um, um, what are things that impress you about your survivor colleagues? Can I go first? I, I Amy, I feel like that's a whole nother webinar. Um, I could I could stand here and list for days. Um, but I'll let I'll let the experts answer. I'll go first. Jeez. What <laughs> what incredible, you know, first of all, incredible speakers, but just really cool people. Uh Jessica and Keelan both are. Um, they, you know. 
throughout my recovery, they've kind of acted as mentors and people I looked up to, but they never made me feel like, uh, like I was beneath them or anything. I was treated as an equal and that's what survivors really need. And I, I just admire their skill set and their knowledge. I don't, I don't consider myself uh, expert in trafficking because it's so complex and nuanced, um, maybe of recovery, but um, their knowledge and like the scope of their knowledge is really impressive to me. Okay, maybe I should say something. Um, so I'm constantly amazed and inspired um, by survivors, even even uh, those that have been fresh out of exploitation and trafficking that we see. Um, you literally have um, you know somebody that is so strong and they're so inspiring because they have literally lived through um, situations that um, that would crumble others or crumble me, um, you know, and, and I'm a pretty tough cookie. I've survived a, a lot of things in life, um, but these individuals have survived even more um, and they have the strength and the the resilience to um, to then go and, and share about that, to to take even to take the, the title of being a survivor leader uh, or lived experience expert. Um, that is huge because they're willing to 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 say, I've been there. I've done that, and sh and share the best the best practices and the information with others on on how not to reincorporate that uh, victimization or that um, that torture um, that pain into the society. So um, there are so many survivors out there. Um, a lot choose not to disclose that they're survivors, and um, and yes, they have so much courage. Um, so. Uh, what what's not to love um, about survivors? Um, they, in my opinion, are amazing, each and every one of them. And I think, um, yeah. So I, I hope I answered that question. Um, feel free to chime in, Jessica and Keelan, if you wanted yeah. to say anything. <laughs> I'm like, I can be here all day and just share because I'm... I think I have great relationships with each and every one of you. And I think everybody's story and journey is very different, which I appreciate the diversity. Um, I know with Amanda, like you sharing about going through a program and me working in direct services shows the work and how important it is and the hard work that survivors go through to be able to build their lives up. Like you're just a prime example of that, of saying like, what happened to me wasn't my fault, but it's my responsibility to heal. And that is just such a strong thing to carry. Um, I think with Jessica, me and Jessica have a beautiful relationship because she was the first survivor that showed me that it was possible. Like I, when I got out, I hid who I was. I hid my trafficking. I didn't want people to know. I was ashamed and guilted and still carried these chains of what my traffickers and buyers would tell me. And so I remember going into this saying, okay, I don't, I don't want to be silenced anymore, but I don't know where to go. And being able to watch Jessica, a strong survivor, say, I'm, I'm not ashamed of what's happened and I'm choosing, created a freedom in me that I continue to carry with me today. But she was the first person in that. And so I just owe her so much. And I think, Susan, I think, there's an important piece that sometimes we don't always recognize is the people who are not survivors that choose to work along survivors and give platforms for us to share. It, I think it's almost expected that survivors are going to carry the torch and we're going to do the work. But I think sometimes we miss the important people who say, this is an injustice that is happening and I'm going to stand by and I'm not going to be silenced and I'm going to create platforms and I'm going to be the change that the world needs. And you're an example of that. And so I've just always been thankful for our friendship and our relationship and what you're doing here today, because a lot of people don't know how they're able to step into this space. And so, yeah, I just appreciate everybody. Oh yeah. my goodness. You just filled my, my cup up to overflowing. Um, so that was so sweet. Thank you, Keelan. Um, shout out to Susan. We love Susan. <laughs> okay. Okay. Enough about me. Um, <laughs> so you put up with all of us. So yay. Susan. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys are amazing. Um, there was another, there are a couple other questions. What they're both really loaded questions. Um, so I think that we will take these and, um, and answer them into 
um, an email reply with the link afterwards. Um, basically, the two questions were, um, what advice do you have for healthcare professionals? Um, and there's so many resources out there. I highly recommend Heal, H-E-A-L, um, Trafficking. They are amazing um, organization that helps provide trainings and resources to the healthcare professional field um, on how to um, serve um, individuals who've been victimized through trafficking and sexual exploitation. Um, then, um, and definitely, uh, there is a, um, subcommittee in here in San Diego and they, you're welcome to join those, uh, meetings. Um, Amy Sharp is the representative for the, um, healthcare, um, subcommittee for the CSEC and human trafficking, um, advisory board committee here in San Diego. Um, and if we are welcome to send out that information as well. Um, the other question was, uh, from an anonymous, uh, attendee, they, they asked, um, how long, um, do, does somebody, um, remain a victim of trafficking. And I, I, um, I do want to address that one short briefly. We have, uh, we're running a little bit, we're right at time right now. Um, but, um, it depends on the individual and, and whether or not they have access to resources. So, um, with that, um, and concluding our, um, webinar this evening, and we will email out more, more, uh, specific information on, on those questions. Thank you so much for everybody who submitted them. Um, but on the topic of, um, of this evening in the webinar um, and how you can directly support. Um, we will, we, we encourage volunteerism. You can find that on our web website, um, but also we will be doing outreach. Um, you, you know, Chief Matsker earlier um, showed a, um, a, a picture of a street outreach, uh, street trafficking that is happening currently. And um, at Alabaster Jar Project, we will be doing a serve project, um, collecting purses and toiletries, little makeup items to go into those purses so that we can then go and um, and visit individuals who are um, soliciting themselves um, in our in, on the streets in different areas. And just to let them know that we're here, that we have services for them, that we have resources for them, and so that we can build relationship with them. Um, and so that is something that I invite you to do. We also have some um, some merchandise on our website uh, that you can link. We have some T-shirts so you can represent um, and share about our organization. But pretty much there are so many organizations in San Diego doing this work. Um, Generate Hope, there is um, One Safe Place, and they are having a, an event tomorrow. Um, we welcome you to, to continue educating yourself, continuing sharing about um, the issue of human trafficking. Now that you know more information, um, we challenge you to share it. And that's um, however it is easiest for you to share, whether it's with your um, email or with its social media or it's verbally, we we encourage you to share. And that is a huge way that you can to you can assist in um, combating human trafficking in our area. Um, we want to thank all of the um, panelists today. Thank you, ja uh, Jessica. Thank you, Keelan and Amanda. And thank you to all of our amazing participants um, that you have uh, joined us this evening. Um, we thank you for spending the evening with us and we look forward to um, providing you feedback and impact. And um, that's all. We, we thank you for being here.